are on our way to Manikarnika, the main cremation ground of Varanasi. And many people come to Varanasi, but most of them come here for the interesting reason to die. Because Varanasi is not just like any other holy city. It is considered to be very auspicious to die in this city. Because it is said that if you die here, you're going to break the cycle of reincarnations. And where most of the burning happens is this cremation ground right here called Manikarnika, which we're about to see very soon. Alright, we just got to Manikarnika. The burnings are happening right behind me. And the topic of reincarnation is an interesting one because it's hard to talk about it with authority. At least for me, because I don't remember any of my past lives and all I have is some experiences in meditation and the words of the beings whom I trust. But it's interesting that in meditation you do observe your mind and your body as just phenomena unfolding and you don't really identify yourself with it. So there is something that is not subject to change in you, that is just awareness, you could call it. And when you're really deep in meditation, you can actually see form arise, a thought arise, the eye arise, exists, and then pass away. And then there's a little space, and then comes up, exists, and passes away. And so the reincarnation is not so much an event that happens at the end of life, but more like a continuously unfolding process where the eye keeps being reinserted into the next moment and in the next moment. And reincarnation means that this process doesn't end just because the body dies. And then there are the words of the beings whom I really trust because reincarnation is not just present in Buddhism and in Hinduism, but almost in all world religions. And even Socrates, when he was waiting for the hemlock, the poison to be brought to him for, as his penalty, his friend Crito asked him, in what way shall we bury you, Socrates? Socrates answers, in any way you like, but first, you must catch me. Be of good cheer, my dear Crito, and say that you are burying my body only, and do with that whatever is usual and what you think is best. Then there is the quote of Muhammad. Each person is only a mask, which the soul puts on for a season. It wears its proper time, then it casts off, and another is born instead. And I remember the great Indian saint Ramana Maharshi, as he was lying in his deathbed, about to die of cancer, and his disciples are around him, telling him, please don't leave us, don't leave us. And he just kind of looked at them and said, don't be silly, where could I go? And even in Christianity, we can find the hints of reincarnation, although most of it has been taken out at the meeting of Constantinople, because it's hard to control people when they believe in the next life. But I found this really cool line in the Gospel of Thomas, where Christ said, if the flesh came into being because of the spirit, it is a wonder. But if spirit came into being because of the flesh, it is a wonder of wonders. Indeed, I am amazed at how this great wealth made its home in such poverty. Now, in the West, we kind of refuse the idea of reincarnation because it seems very optimistic. It kind of feels good that like, oh, okay, we have many lives to live, no worries, because we have a crippling fear of death and this would provide an easy solution to that fear. But if you ask a Buddhist or a Hindu, it's not so much an uh, optimistic worldview, more of a prison. The disciples asked Buddha how long we have been doing this, and he said, imagine a mountain six miles long and six miles high, and every hundred years a man comes with a silk scarf and just rubs it against the mountain. As long as it would take for the silk scarf to wear away the mountain, that's how long we've been doing this. And when you get this sense of stuckness, of awareness identifying with form and not being able to let go of the clinging for so long, you do get the sense of imprisonment.
uh, Buddhists and Hindus alike believe that the last thought at the moment of death is the crucial moment because that's going to determine your next birth. And so the reason why it's so auspicious to die here is because it's said that at the moment of death, Shiva comes and whispers the name of God in your ear. And so you're not holding on to life and you're not pushing away death and you're not caught in your tendencies but you are able to open up and go into the clear white light as they say it because you, it reminds you in the moment of death of God. Now both Buddhists and Hindus alike see life as a preparation for the moment of death. In their whole life they train so at the moment of death the mind doesn't push away death and doesn't cling to life. And the art of dying is not pushing and not grabbing because what keeps awareness stuck in form is our attractions and aversions. And that's the reason we take an incarnation to see and meet our aversions and, aversions and attractions and work with them. And so the whole life becomes a preparation of giving up your preferences. The third Chinese patriarch said that the great way is easy for those who have no preferences and the whole life becomes a process of that, of letting go of what you want to hold on to and not push and accepting what you want to push away. So this city was designed for this purpose, that it helps in the process of death, so awareness can go free without clinging. It's a very different approach from our Western way of thinking about death. Because in the West, the way people die is in a hospital bed, probably in a half-drugged state, surrounded by artificial light and professionally born people, and surrounded with fear about the dying process. And there's no institution that would help a dying person actually be able to embrace this moment instead of pushing it away because everybody's so scared of it that the whole system is designed in a way to stop you from dying. And so the being doesn't have a chance to actually be present for the moment of death. I heard that um, I was told that most people who come to Varanasi to die come to this house uh, for their last few days. Uh, it's Mother Teresa's uh, home, charity home. And so I wanted to check it out and I just uh, left because I couldn't... Uh, it showed a reality that I wasn't ready for. Um, it turns out that most people who come here are not coming here by their own choice but um, some of them were there because their family left them and they had nowhere else to go some of them were so poor and had nothing in the world that they just came to Varanasi to die and they tried to drown themselves in the Ganga and the police found them on the shore and brought them here they were people who wanted to die through drugs and they were brought here. <sighs> and I was just sitting with them, uh, sitting with this man who has been here and is just uh, waiting to die in this place. And um, I can't imagine what it's like to not have your family or any security or anything in your life and you really just come here to die and the nuns do what they can and provide a home and meals and um, 
and a somewhat warm environment but I just didn't realize that um, so much suffering goes into this city as like a last resort to people, a last uh, hope. It's not so much hope, it's more like destitution. <laughs> Last week I have been visiting Monikarnika, the cremation ground, every day and sitting there for long hours just watching the bodies burn. And I've also been meeting people there uh, and some of them are working in hospices in other ones than the one I have been to. And they said that the people who are there are like saints, just peace and quietness is coming out of them. And my experience has been different, and I think when it comes to death, everybody goes into it in a very different way. And even the place is very different from different perspectives, the cremation ground. Because when you look around, people are talking, singing, dogs are barking and playing, people are pissing, somebody's watching Netflix in the background, and it's a complete chaos and mess. But when you close your eyes and you just sit down, you discover that it's the most peaceful and quiet place in the whole city. For me, I have been making a conscious effort this week to invite death into my life, to make it a reality in my life. Because I think for most of us, but at least for me, it's very difficult to actually imagine death, to actually comprehend it, to understand it. And although, although I know I'm going to die, I still can't comprehend it most of the time. It's not present with me. And I feel like part of me is denying it or not fully recognizing that that's the reality, that death is and it's going to happen. If not now, then some point. And so I have been making a conscious effort to invite it into my life. And there are moments I can't imagine it, but there are moments that it does become a reality. And those moments are the most beautiful and scary moments there are. They are incredibly beautiful. They, are, they have such penetrating, strong richness to them because everything that ever was is gone and everything that ever will be is gone and is just the complete destruction of everything that was and you just die into the moment and there's nothing else, just this isness of what is, nothing else. And then, like Christ said, look, I'm making all things new. And the next moment, and you keep dying into the next moment, and you keep being reborn into it. And you can't hold on to anything, and it's this constant feeling of... Ah, that. And I want to try and play with this idea together. What's it like to actually invite death into our life and make it a conscious reality? So let's try. Let's just close our eyes for one minute and see what happens. Now, imagine that you are in the middle of a mandala, a web, exactly like the web of a spider that you're right in the middle of. And out of you comes the strings. And the strings are your relationships, all the beings that keep you being somebody, your friends, 
your co-workers, employers, employees, the people that know you, your family, parents, children, and see how this web gives you a sense of identity, a sense of my life, a sense of story, your own personal narrative, you, how you exist in these people's minds, all the stories, all the connections that have been made. And now let's imagine that you die. It doesn't matter how you die, that's up to you. But you are being removed from this center that you found yourself in. What happens to each string? Imagine how your friends react. Imagine all the phone calls, the crying, the gossiping. What will your parents say or children say? Imagine the funeral. Imagine what people say there. Wasn't he a... She was such a... And now just keep going into the future. Until, and you keep disappearing more and more, just like the ripple on the surface of the water becoming smaller and smaller, until you are just a few yellowed edge photos in the bottom of a drawer, and some vague memories in some people's minds. Oh, I remember her. Um, her name was... Ah. And keep going even further, until you're no more. The pond is clear, the water is still, and you're no longer here on this plane of existence. There is this old story about a Buddhist master and his disciple. And the master had this beautiful crystal goblet and always carried it with him. And the disciple one day asked him, Master, how can you keep such a precious, beautiful thing with you? Aren't you scared it's going to break? And the master said, You see, in my mind it's already broken, so now I can enjoy it. What would happen if in our mind we were already dead, and so now we have a life to live?